In this video, I'm going to do a simple derivation of Bernoulli's equation for fluid flow. And by the end of the video, I hope that you can gain some intuition for why each term of Bernoulli's equation is there and what each term means. For this derivation, we're going to assume that the fluid is ideal. And this means that the fluid is incompressible, which means I cannot make it occupy a smaller volume, meaning that the density of the fluid is constant. This also means that the fluid is going to undergo a steady flow and has no internal friction, which is another way of saying that there is no viscosity. The incompressibility of the fluid plays an important role in the derivation. Let's say that this pipe is actually only a small section of the whole pipe. So fluid is constantly entering the left edge of the pipe, flowing through, and then exiting on the right edge of the pipe. And the fluid that's flowing through this pipe can be described with uh, many different features, but some of those features are the density, its mass, and its volume. And we know that those three variables are related through the density equation, which really is just the ratio of that fluid's mass to its volume. Because the density is constant, we know that this term rho is going to be constant. And on the right-hand side of the equation, we know that because this section of pipe has a certain volume that is not changing, that the volume is also constant. And so what this tells us is that for an incompressible fluid, actually the mass of the fluid in this section of pipe is also going to be constant. And so what this implies is that the rate at which the fluid is entering or leaving the pipe is constant. Let's call this a volume flow rate of the fluid that we'll define as a capital letter Q. And one way we could write this is delta V over delta T, which represents some volume of the fluid, delta V, that flows past a particular point in this section of pipe in a time interval, delta T. And because volumes can always be written as an area times some displacement, I'm going to write delta V as A times delta X. So this would represent the area of the pipe which is circular, times delta x, which is some displacement through which the, the volume of fluid is moving. And, of course, over delta t. And what I notice next is that delta x over delta t would represent the velocity of the fluid at a particular point in the pipe. And so if the volume flow rate of the fluid is constant, then also the product of A and V should be constant. If Q is constant, then A times V should be constant. So the product of the area of the pipe and the speed of the fluid at a particular point in the pipe should be constant. And so if we were to compare two different points along the pipe, we could say that the area at one point, say A1, multiplied by the speed of the fluid at that point, V1, this would be equal to the area at some other point in the pipe, A2, times the speed of the fluid at that point in the pipe, V2. And this equation, A1V1 equals A2V2, is often referred to as the continuity equation. And the continuity equation plays an important role in our ability to understand what's happening with Bernoulli's equation. Most importantly, because now we know that if the area, the cross-sectional area of the pipe decreases, then we know that the speed of the fluid will increase. Let's think about what we just said a little bit more carefully. If the pipe becomes more narrow, then the fluid is going to speed up. And a changing speed means that the fluid must be accelerating. And an acceleration has to be caused by some force. And the only way to get a force here is if there were a difference in pressure. And so now we know that there has to be a difference in pressure between the larger and more narrow portions of the pipe because if there wasn't a difference in pressure, the net force on the fluid would actually be zero. 
And so what we just learned is that there's a difference in pressure that causes a force to be exerted on the fluid, which means that there's work being done on the fluid. And we know that when work is done on an object or a system, it can cause the kinetic energy of that system or the potential energy of that system to change. And so what I would like to do is try to apply the work energy theorem, which says that the work done on the system will be equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy of that system. In order to apply the work energy theorem to the fluid in the pipe, we need to define a few variables. So I'm going to consider a section of the fluid that is on the left edge of the pipe here. And this is a place where the cross-sectional area of the pipe is different than the other side of the pipe, which is a little bit smaller. And so let's consider this little parcel of fluid here. And maybe at the left edge of the pipe, the fluid would be moving with a speed V1, where the cross-sectional area is A1, and where maybe the thickness of that little parcel of fluid is delta x1. And let's imagine that little parcel of fluid moving through the pipe to the right edge of the pipe. Because the pipe becomes a little bit more narrow, the fluid would occupy a slightly larger like horizontal displacement when it gets to the smaller edge of the pipe here, which I'm going to call point 2. And so now the fluid is a little bit more spread out. The area is different on this edge of the pipe. And so I will say here that the fluid is moving with a speed V2, occupies a space delta X1 within the pipe, and the area, the cross-sectional area of this part of the pipe is A2. It's important to remember that the parcel of fluid that I'm considering has a constant volume as it flows through the pipe. I would also like to indicate that the height of the fluid, which could be characterized by the height of the center of mass of the fluid at these two different points, is not the same. So if we look at the height of the center of mass of the fluid at point one, it would be about this high. And I'd like to compare that to the height of the fluid when it gets to the right edge of the pipe, which is here. And I would like to name those two different heights y1 and y2. The important piece of information that we learned from the continuity equation was that this fluid must be experiencing an acceleration forward in the direction of the flow that was due to a difference in pressures. And so, for that reason, I know that there has to be a pressure from behind the fluid and a pressure in front of the fluid, but I know that the pressure behind the fluid must be larger. So we could call this P1 and this P2. And we know that the pressure P1 is greater than the pressure P2. And you can think about these conceptually a little bit too. Uh, the water behind the fluid would be pushing it forward, and the water in front of the fluid, in some sense, gets in the way. If that fluid wasn't there, it would be easier for the fluid to flow forward. Now that we have all of the variables defined, we just need to take them all and put them into that work energy theorem equation. And so the first thing that we could do is try to figure out the work term. Clearly there's a couple of pieces to consider here. Uh, the pressure from behind the fluid is going to exert a force on the fluid over a distance that uh, is positive work that increases the energy of the fluid. And then the pressure in front of the fluid, P2, is negative because it decreases the energy of the fluid. And so the way that we could write the work term of this equation is we could say that the total work is equal to the work done by P1 plus the work done by P2. And the work done by P1 would be the force that P1 exerts on the fluid times the distance over which that force is exerted. And the force it exerts would be given by the pressure times the area, and so that would be P1 
times a1, and the distance over which that force is exerted is delta x1. And because P2 is a pressure pointing in the other direction and decreases the energy of the fluid, the work done by P2 should be negative, but would just simply be equal to P2 A2 times delta x2. And that is the left-hand side of the equation, the work term of that work energy theorem. Now we need to handle the other two terms in the equation, the delta K and the delta U. You should remember that the equation for kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. But because here we're not necessarily talking about an object, we're considering a fluid, we should probably express the mass in terms of its density and volume. It's more easy to keep track and think of the density and volume of a fluid. And so for that reason, when we write delta K, we can think of this as one-half, and instead of M, we could write its density rho times its volume V, and we still need to multiply by V squared, which is the speed squared. And if we're considering the change in kinetic energy, that should be the change in the squares of the speed. And so this should be V2 squared, the final speed, minus V1 squared, which is the initial speed. And we can do a similar thing for the potential energy. The gravitational potential energy typically takes the form of mgh, and here the change in gravitational potential energy would be rho v g, and instead of h, here we can define the difference in heights between the two points as delta y, or we could write that as y2 minus y1. And so now let's combine these three terms. The three terms that we're going to combine are the work term here, the change in kinetic energy term here, and the change in potential energy, gravitational potential energy term there. And we would write this as follows. P1, A1, delta X1, minus P2, A2, delta x2 equals one-half rho v v2 squared minus v1 squared plus delta u which is rho v g times y2 minus y1. And now there's a little bit of simplification that can occur. First of all, at the very beginning when we were uh, arriving at the continuity equation, we wrote a volume as an area times a length. And here in the work terms, we see something similar happening. A1 times delta x1 and A2 times delta x2. That would actually be a volume V. And so the way that we can write this is P1 times V minus P2 times V which is a rem reminder that the parcel of fluid that I'm considering has a constant volume, I don't need to write that as V1 and V2, equals one-half rho V, V2 squared minus V1 squared, plus rho V G times Y2 minus Y1. And I hope you can see that every term of the equation has a V in it, and so the volume of the fluid does not influence any of these terms in the equation. Actually, it cancels out of every term. And so what we're left with is P1 minus P2 equals one-half rho times the difference in the squares of the speeds plus rho g y2 minus y1. And we can stop here. This is Bernoulli's equation for fluid flow, but commonly this is written in a slightly different way, where instead of the difference in pressures equals one-half and the difference in the speeds and the difference in the heights, we have everything related to point one on the left-hand side of the equation and everything related to point two on the right-hand side of the equation. And so I think I'll write it in that same way. And so this could be written as P1 plus one-half rho v1 squared 
plus rho g y1 equals p2 plus one half rho v2 squared plus rho g y2. And this is Bernoulli's equation for fluid flow. And I hope now you have a little bit of intuition about where each one of these terms comes from. Clearly, the terms that look like one-half mv squared are related to the change in the speed or the change in the kinetic energy of the fluid. The terms that look like mgh, the rho g y1 and rho g y2 terms, have to do with the change in the height of the fluid. And p1 and p2 are not just pressures, but they are related to the work that is being done on the fluid by the fluid that comes behind and in front of uh, the fluid that you're considering. Sometimes things can get a little messy when you're using Bernoulli's equation to solve a problem, just because there's a lot of numbers to deal with. And so here are a few tips. In most Bernoulli's equation problems, one of the speeds are given and one of the speeds uh, are not. And so V1 might be given, but V2 is not. Typically, instead, the cross-sectional areas are given. And first, you need to use the continuity equation to solve for the other speed. Another common thing that happens in Bernoulli's equation problems is only one of the heights are given, or the difference in the heights is given. And this is an important time to remember that only changes in gravitational potential energy are important. Discrete values at a particular height are not so important. And so you could very easily define the height or position of y1 to be the place where the gravitational potential energy of the fluid is equal to zero. And in that case, one of the terms of your equation could be zero.